In this video, we will talk about Streptococcus pyogenes. This is probably the highest yield streptococcal species of all of the different type of strep that we'll talk about. If you're going in order in the microbiology series, you'll recall that we've been following this flow diagram, talking about gram-positive bacteria, and then gram-positive bacteria get separated into one of three different categories depending on their shape. We've only talked about cocci so far, which are our round or spherical shaped bacterial pathogens. And within that cocci category, we can separate staph from strep, depending on if it's catalase positive, which would be staph, or catalase negative, which would be strep. And in the most recent videos, we've talked about strep, so we're obviously going to continue that direction by talking about catalase negative strep. Now within the broader category of catalase negative gram positive cocci, or strep, we further subdivide depending on the pattern of hemolysis. In the previous two videos, you saw that we were talking about alpha hemolytic bacterial pathogens, namely strep pneumoniae and viridens strep. But in this video, we'll now go to that center category and talk about beta hemolytic strep. Now recall again from a few videos ago that beta hemolysis refers to the complete breakdown of hemoglobin on that plate, as you see in that image. Now within the beta hemolytic category, we have to determine if we're talking about strep pyogenes or if we're talking about some other type of beta hemolytic strep. And the way that we do that is depending on the bacteria's response to bacitracin. So if it's bacitracin sensitive, it's strep pyogenes, and if it's bacitracin resistant, it's strep agalactiae. In this video, we'll be talking about strep pyogenes. So with that said, let's get started. As you just saw in our flow diagram, we're talking about a gram-positive, catalase-negative, beta-hemolytic strep, which is bacitracin-sensitive. And that bacitracin piece is so important because it's going to differentiate this against strep agalactiae if the test writer doesn't give you any other information. This is Lansfeld Group A, so sometimes you'll, you'll see this written shorthand as Group A strep, or GAS if you're a third or fourth year medical student and you're on the wards, you know, on the floors, and you read the shorthand in somebody's note, if you see capital G-A-S, that's group A strep, they're referring to strep pyogenes. This is also pyrolidonyl arylamidase positive, or PYR positive. For both group A and PYR, I don't need you to worry about what that means for the purposes of USMLE or COMLEX, but just know that if you see that, it refers to strep pyogenes. This strep is featured in a chain-like growth pattern or a chain-like arrangement, which is not unique to strep pyogenes as you've seen already, but it is a buzzword that gets thrown around and I think you should know it. Strep pyogenes is found in the nasopharynx and it's for that reason that it's highly associated with pharyngitis. If the test writer is gonna give you an image of strep pyogenes, this is what you're gonna see. And you can appreciate in these images the chain-like arrangement of the cocci organism. So if you zoom in, you see it's cocci, it's a coccus, it's spherical, but it's organized into chains, and that's strep pyogenes for you. So this is your overview, and just remember that bacitracin sensitivity is what differentiates strep pyogenes against strep agalactiae, which will be the next video after this one. So obviously, I need to give you a mnemonic to remember this very easily, because this can be the difference between getting the question correct or getting the question incorrect if the test writer goes after those bacterial flow diagrams. So when you think of strep pyogenes, you can see that it has the word genes in the name. And when I think of genes, I think of tracing the genes of pyogenes and trace for bacitracin. So trace the genes of strep pyogenes. And you're tracing the genes, so that tells you pyogenes or you know pyogenes, and you're tracing it for bacitracin. So strep pyogenes is bacitracin sensitive. Super easy mnemonic. This can literally be the difference between getting the question correct versus incorrect on your board exam or in class exam. Now let's talk about virulence factors. And virulence factors for strep pyogenes are pretty important, although I would say that they're probably not as high yield as the associated clinical features that you see, because strep pyogenes, as we'll talk about in a few slides, can cause this vast array of different clinical diseases and clinical syndromes. So we'll go through the virulence factors somewhat quickly here. The first two that I wanna talk about, and I list them here together because they're very similar, is an M protein and a hyaluronic acid capsule. So the M protein inhibits C3B opsonization. And if you've watched the strep pneumonia video, we've already talked about opsonization, which is when basically a bacterial pathogen gets tagged with C3B 
And then those specialized macrophages in the spleen see the C3B and know that they need to get that bacterial pathogen out. The M protein in strep pyogenes inhibits this process, which makes it harder for our immune system to carry out that function of opsonization, and therefore strep pyogenes is much more virulent. The hyaluronic acid capsule is related because it inhibits phagocytosis, and phagocytosis is the end product or the end goal of opsonization, so these two processes are very much related. What's very important to know is that antibodies that the body forms against this M protein in strep pyogenes is responsible for the pathophysiology of rheumatic fever. And the mnemonic you see on this slide, it all has to do with the letter M. So M protein causes rheumatic fever, so I'm highlighting that M, via this process called molecular mimicry. You see M's everywhere. And what molecular mimicry refers to is that when you have mixing of epitopes between a bacterial pathogen and a native endogenous protein in the body, when the body's immune system wants to clear the pathogen, it sees an element of the pathogen which shares some type of structural similarity to an endogenous or normal protein found in the body. And therefore, the immune system incorrectly attacks part of the body, which it shouldn't be doing because it thinks it's attacking that same feature that it saw on the pathogen. And this is called molecular mimicry. Now, in the case of rheumatic fever, this is specifically arising because the immune system is undergoing molecular mimicry and it's attacking cardiac myosin protein. So it's the myosin protein in the heart that the body thinks is the strep pyogenes because the M protein looks like the cardiac myosin protein. And to really make this stupidly simple and explain it to you like you're in fifth grade, on the left, imagine you've got strep pyogenes, that's our bacteria, and on the right, you've got a heart. On the strep pyogenes, you see that streptococcal M protein shown in pink, and I've uh, depicted it here as a diamond shaped. And on the heart, you've got cardi cardiac myosin proteins, which I've also depicted as a diamond shape, but let's just say they're a little bit smaller, and they're shown there in that different color in orange. Now, the immune system's perspective, you have these T-cells come along, and the T-cells get confused because of molecular mimicry. It sees diamonds in both areas, and it says, I need to clear diamonds. To be honest, the immune system can be really stupid at times, and this is the basis for autoimmune diseases. T-cells come along, and they go, diamond bad, must get diamond out. So it sees pink diamonds that are big, it sees orange diamonds that are small, and it kills both of them. So in the process of doing this, the T-cells are not only clearing strep pyogenes by recognizing its M protein, but it's also attacking endogenous, native, normal cardiac myosin protein. Now, obviously, this is a gross oversimplification, but this is what molecular mimicry is, and this is the basis or the pathophysiology of rheumatic fever. So it's all because of that M protein, the molecular mimicry, rheumatic fever, cardiac myosin proteins. So just remember the letter M, and you should remember all that stuff I just mentioned. The last virulent factor that we should talk about is protein F. Now, this is a fibronectin binding protein that promotes epithelial cell attachment. So in a nutshell, it makes it easier for strep pyogenes to get in. And the way that I remember this is protein F equals fibronectin, which fuses to epithelial cells. So I'm just changing letters here to make my brain remember the letter F. Protein F, fibronectin, fusion, aka attachment, and epithelial cells instead of epithelial cells. So that's it for the high yield virulence factors. Like I said before, where I think you should pay special attention are the clinical sequelae, all these things you see on this slide that can be due to strep pyogenes. Now, admittedly, this is a lot of stuff, so I'm going to do my best to simplify this for you. But the goal of this conversation is to train your brain to form those third order connections so that if you're taking an exam and you start to get a question that describes something like post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So they're talking about kidney stuff and edema and hypertension and oligoria. And then they just throw in there like three words in the vignette that the person or the patient had a sore throat a couple weeks ago. Now you should, your brain should really connect those dots and go, oh, that's post-strep glomerulonephritis. They're talking about strep pyogenes. So you need to form these connections and understand that buzzwords associated with all of the clinical sequelae you see on this slide can all be related back 
sharing a common connection being that they're caused by strep pyogenes. So the way that you can organize this if you need a mnemonic, and I, I don't know how useful this will be for you, is that strep pyogenes, just write it, rewrite it as strep pyogenes, and then you've got P-A-G-I-N-E-S for pharyngitis, acute rheumatic fever, glomerulonephritis, impetigo, necrotizing fash, erysipelas, and scarlet fever. So we're just, there's, the Y doesn't stand for anything, it's just there. Um, let's run through these one at a time. This will be kind of rapid review style. And I'll just throw out the buzzwords that you should keep a lookout for. And again, start to train your brain to relate all of these buzzwords back to strep pyogenes. So pharyngitis, you're going to see tonsillar inflammation plus or minus exudate. This is a classic image. If you see this, it's strep pharyngitis. Usually the question is going to feature a toddler or a young child because this doesn't really infect adults as much as it does children. You're going to see some nonspecific symptoms like a fever or lymphadenopathy, and you treat this with penicillin. And for the purposes of exams, especially for step two, level two and beyond, know that the treatment with penicillin is there to prevent rheumatic fever because it's an untreated strep pyogenes infection that leads to rheumatic fever. And with that said, that's a good transition into rheumatic fever. So this will typically occur two to four weeks after a strep pyogenes infection. You'll see symptoms like Sydenham chorea, which is you know, irregular non-repetitive movements of the head, limbs, and neck. And just like that molecular mimicry that we talked about with the myosin protein in the heart, there is a lot of thought that this is actually due to cross-reactivity against the basal ganglia. So the immune system incorrectly targeting the basal ganglia causes this aberrant movement. You can see migratory polyarthritis, pancarditis, pan meaning all layers. So you can see myocarditis, endocarditis, and or pericarditis. So all of the different itises of the heart. That's what pancarditis means. You can see subcutaneous nodules, as you see on this slide, and erythema marginatum, which you also see on this slide. So if you see a weird rash, train your brain to think about strep pyogenes. If you see abnormal movements, train your brain to think about strep pyogenes. You know, we're thinking here rheumatic fever, and that's why we treat strep pyogenes pharyngitis to avoid getting to rheumatic fever. Now, a very, very high yield one is post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. As the name implies, this is a glomerular nephritidy that occurs after a strep pyogenes infection. So this will follow either strep pharyngitis or strep impetigo. And the labs that they'll give you will show ASO titer elevations and low C3 levels. If you see those two things together, you really want to think about PSGN, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. On the images, which are very important to recognize, you'll see immune complex deposition in the glomerular basement membrane. And you'll see what's described as a, quote, lumpy, bumpy appearance on immunofluorescent microscopy. If you see symptoms like hematuria, hypertension, edema, oliguria, that should really trigger your brain here because this is a nephritis, as glomerulonephritis implies. So if you see those symptoms, think post-strep, try to connect all these dots back to strep pyogenes. Now let's talk about impetigo. Very, very high yield picture and buzzword, honey-crusted lesions on an erythematous base. If you see that, stop what you're doing, don't pass go, select strep pyogenes, and treat it with mupirocin. Now specifically, I'm going to throw this in for completeness sake, Strep pyogenes causes the non-bullous type of empatigo, but if you have bullous empatigo, that's a different pathogen, so that's not strep pyogenes. Similar, let's talk about another rash, erysipelas. This is a well-demarcated inflamed patch or plaque. You can see in this image that it usually involves the cutaneous lymphatics and the uppermost layer of the dermis. And because of that reason, it's usually raised and very well demarcated. You can see that that red inflamed area on this person's face is very well demarcated. There's a crisp line between the erysipelas and the normal skin. It's raised up and you can see involvement of the cutaneous lymphatics. So that's erysipelas. Scarlet fever, this is the last one we're gonna talk about. Uh, you're gonna see pharyngitis, but associated symptoms of what's known as quote, strawberry red tongue with circumoral pallor, which basically means whiteness around the mouth. So like the area around the mouth will be very white and pale, but then the other re regions of the face will have the kind of normal flushing to it. And you'll see what's described as a sandpaper-like rash that usually spares the palms and soles. So these images are pretty high yield. Of note, this is a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction to an erythrogenic toxin A, which I didn't talk about on the virulence factor slide, but I'll include it here for completeness sake. Treatment, really briefly, penicillin is the answer. If they're allergic, use a macrolide. You can also use first or second generation cephalosporins. So here's your summary slide. 
Streptococci, it's a caucus, it occurs in chains, gram positive, catalase negative, beta hemolytic, PYR positive, group A, and BASA tracin sensitive because you trace the genes. High yield virulence factors, M protein, uh, which is responsible for molecular mimicry and a lot of the different pathophysiologies of the associated clinical syndromes and clinical diseases. Hyaluronic acid inhibits phagocytosis. Protein F binds fibronectin. Just remember your Fs and your Ms for protein F and your M protein. And treatment is penicillin. That's it. I know I flew through this one. A lot of good stuff here. A lot of important networks to create in your brain, but this is what you need to know.